Okay, so um, who likes music here? Anyone like music? Who likes watching television and taking selfies? <laughs> well, it's crazy, because I think most people do, at least in America, right? It's, it's amazing that a 2013 survey showed that the average American teen spends seven and a half hours a day consuming media. It's probably more in 2014. TV, movies, music, internet, social media, your smartphone, your dumb phone, your clam phone, every phone. Everyone's on the media. And we all watch media to be entertained. But we have to remember that watching media is much more powerful than we think it is. Media has the power to literally change the way we think, the way we act, and the way we live. All right, so here's the thing. Anyone enjoy watching sports? Any Super Bowl fans in the house? Okay, Super Bowl is a really interesting thing because it's like a religious holiday in America, right? Some people worship the Super Bowl. But it's crazy because you have two types of fans. You have one group of fans who, who are like, oh, yeah, football, yeah, let's do this, yeah, football. And then you have another group who are like, I like the commercials. I love the commercials. <laughs> Guys, why do you sound so high-pitched right there? Was that all you? <laughs> But seriously, two groups of Super Bowl fans. A couple years ago, I went to a Super Bowl party, and I was eating my hot dog or my hamburger or whatever was going on, eating chips, just having a good time. And it was crazy because this, this commercial came on, and it zoomed in on this cheeseburger with bacon. And everyone was like, throw this hot dog away. Get me one of those. And so the cheese and the bacon, and then it zoomed out, and you start seeing the slender arm. And you see the slender body, and it's this bathing suit, basically bikini model, eating this hamburger like it's some sexual ritual. And at this point, it got really awkward in the room, right? There's a couple of things that happened. First, the moms were like, dear God, close your eyes, Jimmy. Go play outside. Take the iPad. Then there was another group of people, they were the girls with their boyfriends or husbands, and they're like, this is so gross. She's so gross, ugh. And then you had another group of people who were like, does she come with the hamburger? <laughs> and so you have all these mixed responses. And I was standing there, and honestly, I was in a little bit of a haze because I was still recovering from that close-up shot of the cheese and the bacon. I was like, I want one. I'm loving it. Um, it wasn't a McDonald's commercial, though. So here we had this issue where, obviously, it was a very poor representation of what a hamburger should be, because they were using sex to sell their stupid product, right? And it's no mystery that sex does sell hamburgers. And I can't help but think, and it was a Carl's Jr. commercial. You might call it Hardee's around here. I don't know which one it is, but it's the same company. But sadly enough, I, I can't help but think that these marketing people in their offices were sitting around brainstorming before they made this commercial going, huh, all right, let me speak to the men of America. Hey, stupids, how you doing? You like football? We know you like football. You like bacon? We know you love bacon. What's more American than that? Okay. But I know what else you like. You like cleavage. So here's some. Go ahead. It's on us. The first one's free. Go ahead. You like that, don't you? Yeah. You like, you're confused now, because you want a burger and the woman at the same time. Oh, you, oh yeah, we know you, we know you. So we're going to zoom out. We're going to let you enjoy both. Because here's the thing, stupid. You like what you feel right now, don't you? Because every time you drive down the street and you see that smiling star, you're going to remember those sexual feelings you had while watching our hamburger simultaneously with our bikini model. So somehow you're going to mysteriously associate your sexual feelings with your stupid hamburger. So you're going to drive on through, and you're going to make us rich, and you're going to get your bacon. So thank you, stupids of America. Thank you for making us filthy rich. Thank you. Some of you are like, yeah, that sounds about right. And others of you are like, dang, I had one yesterday. I, I didn't even know why. I was like, I feel really good right now. I want to. <laughs> so two things should be happening. And I'm speaking specifically to the gentlemen. 
But you should be offended, at least slightly. You should be offended for two reasons. One, the media thinks you're that dumb, that you have no control over your, your sexual desire. And you should be offended, secondly, because this woman, and I don't even know her name, sadly, someone's daughter, someone's sister, perhaps someone's mother, and she's literally becoming reduced to an object. Her value is almost identical to the hamburger at that point. And, and I don't care if you are asking for that kind of attention. No woman deserves to be treated like a piece of meat. Amen? So I want to awaken your mind, because this workshop is called God in the Media. And I can tell you, and I hope at the end of this workshop, you'll realize that God is present in the media, and there are ways where he is very not present. And so I want us to develop this sense of understanding how do we see God in the media, and where do we see that he is obviously not? And how do we discern between what we should listen to, what we should watch? Because I'll tell you, God is present wherever there is authentic love, wherever there is truth, Wherever there is sacrifice, wherever there is beauty, wherever there is goodness, wherever there is virtue. God is absent when those qualities that represent God are stripped away by counterfeits. For example, when you see nothing but lust, lies, selfishness, ugliness, and sin. And I tell you that God is not there in the media in those moments. But just by watching the Super Bowl, I will tell you, and I want you once again to develop this, it's almost like a muscle you have to work out, where you have to literally use your mind so that you can come to develop your thoughts in Christ, to hold all thoughts captive and say, yeah, God is here and God is not here. So just in watching the Super Bowl, let's use this muscle. Where is God present? Think about that for a second. Where do you think you can find God just in watching the Super Bowl and the commercials? I'll tell you. God is present in the talent and sacrifice of the players. Every gift that they have that brought them to that moment is from God. Scripture tells us that in him we live, we move, and we have our being. So we can't do anything, let alone throw a ball and catch it. God is present in all the hard work and training of each team. God is present in the sportsmanship that we see on the field. God is present when certain players actually witness to God and give thanks to him. God is present even in the stories and commercials that inspire us. Because amidst the trashy commercials, there are actually some really good ones that touch people's hearts. And usually they're things about like family and values and, and things that move us as people. And I'll tell you where God is not present. God is not present in the worship of football. A lot of Americans, unfortunately, they treat football as their religion. They treat organized sports as their religion. Don't even go to church anymore. They show up to the game and they're there tailgating and they're the first ones there. But God, honor the Lord's day? No. Nah. Unfortunately, God is not there. Now, nothing's wrong with watching sports and going to the game, but making God the priority and making it to mass, making him the center, and then enjoying the rest of the day, that's different. God is not present in the cheap shots between players. Right? You see it in football. You see it in soccer. Anyone watching the World Cup? It's pretty amazing. Big game tomorrow. Pope versus Pope. Pope Francis Argentina versus Pope Benedict in Germany. It's going to be an awesome game. <laughs> but you may have seen that one player called Suarez who literally bit <laughs> the shoulder. <laughs> who does that? It's like, get out of my way! <laughs> I think you need counseling. <laughs> Give this man a hamburger, a Carl's Jr. hamburger. Keep the girl away from him. <laughs> Seriously, God is not present in those moments. God is not present in the dirty commercials that make us laugh, but at the cost of a person's decency. Guys, I, I, I above all people, really appreciate humor, but when it's at the cost of stripping someone's dignity down, literally and figuratively, unfortunately, then there's a problem there. We need to develop the sense of God's awareness and renewing our minds because if we don't, we won't even know when God is speaking to us because the truth is God can speak to us anywhere and everywhere, even in sports, even in commercials, even in movies, even in songs. There have been times where I'd be in the car listening to a song. I'd be touched so deeply. It wasn't even a Christian song. 
So if you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, you can hear God at times speaking to you. But on the same token, if you don't develop this sense of God's awareness, you won't even know when you're being played by the devil. You won't even know when you're just subscribing wholeheartedly to something that isn't even Christian. And it doesn't mean that you have to listen to Christian music all the time and watch VeggieTales nonstop. But what it does mean is that you have to be aware of when you're listening to a song or watching a movie or watching something really sketchy, and it is not helping you. It might even be leading you into sin. So I'm going to lead us through a couple of examples because I want to take actual real songs and shows so that we can develop this awareness. First one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I can't sing as high as high as him. In interviews, he's like, hi, I'm Bruno Mars. You guys know who this guy is? Yes? Atlanta, East Coast, you guys know who he is, right? Okay. He was actually at the Super Bowl, I think it was last year, where he performed and he, pro he did a great job. But he has this popular song, and it's called Locked Out of Heaven. And at this point, all the grandmas are like, well, we should pray for him. Why is he locked out of heaven? You're going to find out right now. Because I'm going to put up the lyrics and we're going to do some karaoke. Yeah. Okay. Once again, I have to drop the key because I cannot sing as high as this man who sings like a girl. Uh, so if you could join me, please. And please don't be scandalized. I am sharing this for a reason. <clears throat> it's a cappella. I have a screen right here. Never had much faith in love or miracles. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Never wanna put my heart on the line. Uh, 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 uh. Swimming in your water, something spiritual. Uh, 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 uh. I'm born again every time you spend the night. E -I -E -I. <clears throat> Cause your sex takes me to paradise Cause your sex takes me to paradise And it shows Yeah, yeah, yeah Slide Cause you make me feel like I've been locked out of heaven For too long this is really weird. For too long, oh, yeah, you make me feel like I've been locked out of heaven for too long. Ow, my neck. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank you. In the words of Adele, Thank you. All right, so let's take a look at this song. Catchy song, people sing it all the time. It's still on the radio, it's one of those hits. But we really have to consider, um, what is he talking about? Why is he so excited? What is he excited about? Uh, shacking up. That much is clear, he's really excited about sex. And Bruno, if you keep acting like that, if you keep sleeping around, you are gonna be locked out of heaven. It's gonna be sad. But I'm gonna pray for you. But seriously, let's use our renewed minds in Christ to consider what makes this song good and bad. Because I will tell you, there is both good and there is both bad in this song. Okay? So let's take a look. What is good and bad in this song? Because the truth is, we can find what God is and where he isn't. So, there is one line where in the middle it says, I'm born again every time you spend the night. Okay? Okay? He's kind of using the spiritual reference to talk about very, uh, not so spiritual things. But on the same token, let me put it this way. Is he talking about his wife? No. Because why would your wife just spend the night? A little bit dysfunctional? Um, <laughs> some of you are like, yep, I kick my husband out. I'm born again every time you spend the night. So clearly he's not talking about sex in the context of? Thank you. And that would be a sin. That would be called fornication. And unfortunately, that's not kosher with Jesus. The thing is, on the same token, God created sex. God created sex. 
So we're in a bit of a bind right now because the type of language he's using here, it's like a, it's like a almost erotic love poem, yeah? And some of you are like twitching in your seats. You're like, I'm really uncomfortable right now. <laughs> but if you open up the Bible about midway, there is a book in that Bible called the Song of Songs. You've been reading on that? <laughs> Adoration. Man, it's getting really hot in here. Because the book is about erotic love poetry. And why is God, because this is an inspired book of God, why is this in the Bible? I thought sex was dirty as a sin, as bad as evil. That's how you got here, but you know, God can handle that. God created sex, and he created it good. I don't know if you knew this, but for the first commandment that God made to Adam and Eve was bear fruit and multiply, a.k.a. have sex and have babies now. And Adam was probably like, sir, yes, sir, I will obey. Thank you, God. Thank you. <laughs> Friends, it's the truth. It's right there. The scriptures are hilarious. Scriptures are hilarious. God invented sex and he made it beautiful. He made it so beautiful that he created it into a sacrament. One of the seven sacraments of our church, friends, is marriage. And sex is intimately united with that sacrament. In fact, if, if the couple does not engage in marital love, then it's not even an eval, it's not, it hasn't been consummated. It's not a valid thing. And so it's crazy how important this element of our life as humans is. But it's not everything. And I'm going to get to that. But I want to focus on the beauty because God created it. He created it good. When Bruno sings about, because your sex takes me to paradise, it's funny because on one hand he's wrong because he's not married and he shouldn't be sleeping around. But on another hand, he's actually right. Because sex is so holy and it's so good that it does take people to paradise. It is so beautiful and pleasurable and good. You don't believe me? You're still going, man, this Asian boy is kind of like perverted. <laughs> I'm a complaint to Steubenville. Those Californians, land of fruits and nuts, I don't know. I'm gonna, you don't believe me? I'm going to explain it to you. What do we make the sign of? The sign of the cross in the name of the... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We do it all the time. And you had that lesson in catechism. It was kind of awkward, but they're like, um, yeah, it's really mysterious. Uh, Three-leaf clover, that's kind of like God. One clover, but three distinct parts. All right, let's move on. It's too complicated. And it is. It's a mystery. It is the greatest mystery there will ever be, the mystery of God. But let me, let me break it down really quick in regards to this topic of sex. From all eternity, the Father is the source of creation. We've, he is the beginning. He is the end. Before the world was even created, from the Father flows the Son. I don't, know even, I don't even know if that's correct terminology. But the Son and the Father are one. They are equal. The Son comes from the Father. And the Father pours out his love, his infinite love perfectly. He gives it all to his Son. And the Son receives this love from the Father and he gives it back to his Father. He holds nothing back. And this love between them is so profound, it's a third person. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. You hanging with me? Okay, so where do we see this in the most profound way in our world? Let me break it down for you. When a husband and a wife get married, when they say their I do from their hearts, typically that evening, they then exchange their vows, not only spiritually, but bodily. The husband gives his love and his body to his wife, gives everything. I give everything to you. The wife receives that love and gives it back to the husband. That's what this is about. And that love between them is so profound that nine months later, a third person flows forth from their union. <laughs> what, 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 what? What? Are you guys hanging with me? Did you hear that? Friends. When a married couple engages in sex, and as a result, and yes, babies come from sex, God is glorified, amen? amen? Friends, you are the result of a union between husband and wife. 
Literally, the human family symbolizes in a very mysterious way the very life of the Trinity, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That has nothing to do with dirty and ugly and gross. It has something to do with holy and mysterious and beautiful. But what's the problem here? What is the issue? The issue is so often in media, in our conversations, in our culture, the beauty of it gets stripped away and it becomes purely bodily, it becomes purely just animal. It becomes just about the pleasure, just about hooking up and shacking up, just about that. And friends, this can become a whole different talk and I can't go off on a tangent for too long, but I will say this, that God has a plan for sex and marriage and it is beautiful, it is life-giving, it is good. But if a person, and this is all of us, if we take it out of God's plan in his context, then I assure you, you will pay the consequences. You will pay the consequences. You don't believe me? Just listen to a Taylor Swift song. An Adele song. Her whole album was about a relationship gone wrong. Because sex is a gift. Your sexuality is a gift. It is beautiful. But it's like atomic energy. Atomic energy can go two ways. It can power and give life to a whole city and nation. It can also melt and destroy everything. Next on Jerry Springer. <laughs> Maury, Maury. It's terrible, but it's the truth is that God has a plan, and it is beautiful, it is good, but when people take it out of the context for which it belongs, it becomes ugly, it becomes destructive, it becomes painful. So back to this song, we need to renew our minds with God's grace about sex, about a lot of things, but we're sold counterfeits of the real deal. Clearly in this Bruno Mars song, he's not promoting a lifestyle that's good for you or for me. Obviously, if you're married, you know, it's, it's, it's a blessing to be able to exchange that kind of love within that context. But if you're not, this is not a good way to live because you will have to bear the consequences of sin, of broken hearts. So let's renew our minds because once again, with this song, we see on one hand, God is present in the fact that he's the one who created sex. And it does take us to paradise. But unfortunately, when you take it out of God's plan, it does lock you out of heaven. And so you need to renew your minds. And I'm not saying any of these examples I'm giving today, I'm not promoting them. I'm not saying, hey, you should listen to them. And hey, you should just think of Song of Songs when you hear it. I'm not saying that. Because the truth is in this talk today, I can't be like, um, yeah, don't watch this. Um, yeah, watch that. Um, no, don't watch that. Just, just Veggie Tales. That's safe. Friends, you have to develop your minds and your hearts and your conscience. Because the truth is certain songs certain shows, certain movies. Some people can watch it and it doesn't bother them. Other people, it bothers them. It leads them into sin. And that can be a very murky area. But it's not my job to tell you, don't watch that, watch that, don't listen to that, listen to that. I want rather that you would develop your own conscience, that you would develop your minds renewed in Christ to be able to say, what am I listening to? Because if you're listening to a song, I want you to listen to the lyrics, not just like with the beat, oh, I love the beat, this is awesome, so good. And it's talking about trash and you have no idea. I dare you to go online and print out the lyrics and, and read them. Yeah, yeah. Read those lyrics and see how you feel. Ladies, you'll probably be like, oh, it's kind of gross. I like the beat though, it's tight. <laughs> Gotta use your minds. Next slide. <laughs> okay, Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad is one of the most popular TV shows probably of all time. They were just nominated for, for 16 Emmy Awards, okay? So this is a pretty popular show. Okay, but the thing is, and don't be like, um, Paul J. Kim um, told me this weekend, Mom, that I should be able to watch Breaking Bad because it's about the Song of Songs. You're going to get me into trouble because you're not listening. The reason I'm bringing this up is because it's a popular TV show, and chances are some of you have already seen it or at least heard about it. But the story concept is this. It's about, <laughs> it's a very interesting story. It's a story about an everyday middle-aged man who is a chemistry teacher finds out he has lung cancer, his, his brother-in-law is a DEA police officer, 
He goes with them on a drug bust. These guys were cooking methamphetamines, a narcotic a drug. And he asked, how much do they make off each cell? It was like tens of thousands of dollars. And he bit into the temptation. He was curious, and he was a chemist, so he became very good at cooking drugs. And as a result, you see from season one to the end of the seasons, this man's one choice, this one decision, leads him into this world of sketchiness, this world of darkness, where you see him literally destroy everything that is good in his life. That's Breaking Bad in a nutshell. And it's extremely sketchy at times. It's very graphic. It's very violent. And that's the truth. That's what it is. It's a very popular show, though. So at this point, many people will say, oh, that show is the bomb. It's crazy good. I want to see it. Oh, my gosh. But with renewed minds in God, even without having seen it or having to see it, let's see where we don't find God and where we find God. And it's pretty clear, guys. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, um, yeah, he's probably not in, like, the methamphetamines part. He's probably not in, like, the drug dealing. Um, yeah, the time he shot that guy in the face, um, it's probably not there either. Um, I think I'm done now. I don't have anything more to say. Good small group, yeah. So clearly, God is not there in those things. God is not there in, in organized crime. God is not there in, in, in killing people or killing their souls or destroying your family. God is not there. But I want to challenge you with a question. Where do we see God in this situation in this show? And I will tell you. We see God in the conscience of the characters. Oh, interesting. Conscience. What is a conscience, friends? you know what a conscience is? Everyone has one. Everyone in this room. Everyone has a conscience. Miley Cyrus, believe it or not, has a conscience. Hitler had a conscience. Not to say that Miley was as bad as Hitler. Hitler didn't twerk. That would have been weird. <laughs> everyone has a conscience. Whether you're Catholic or not, everyone was born with the moral law stamped in their heart, in their soul. What does that look like? Well, most cultures, most people, regardless of religion, culture, or race, understand it's wrong to kill somebody. Understand it's wrong to steal what's not yours. Understand it's wrong to take someone who is not your wife or husband and have an extramarital affair. Most people understand this, and it's innate. It's natural. It's called a conscience. The Catechism of the Catholic Church it describes to us that this conscience is like a road map. It's like a guide, a compass that leads us to God, leads us home. So what do I mean where we see the consciences of the characters? Because I believe a person can find God even in the story, ironically. You see it when people are struggling between choosing right and wrong. That main character, Walter White, the chemistry teacher, the ordinary, average, married man with a kid, you see it because you see him literally wrestle with himself. He's like, um, this is not good. He's a bit of a spaz, you know? He's like, um, but the drugs, um, I can make a lot of money here. And, um, could help my family. You see this wrestling match, good versus evil, the angel on this, this shoulder, the devil on this shoulder, literally having war in this man's conscience. And unfortunately, in this story, he chooses the devil's side. He chooses wrong. He falls into sin. And you see how this one sin literally gives birth to more sin, to more sin. It becomes this pyramid scheme, becomes this ripple effect that literally leads to darker and heavier and sketchier sin in situations where this man, who was once actually just kind of an a upstanding citizen at one point in the first season, becomes a, a literal maniac. He loses his mind. He loses his soul. He becomes a drug lord. He kills anyone in his way, and nothing will stop him. And there's actually a side character, because he becomes sort of a protagonist. His name is Jesse. In the beginning, he was kind of a, a dork. He was kind of a drug dealer already, so you didn't really side with him. But you see him wrestling throughout the seasons, too, where you see him going, um, uh, Mr. White, uh, we're, we're in a little bit deep right now. People are getting hurt. Like, people in our lives are, are experiencing bad things because of what we're doing. We should probably stop now. 
and he doesn't. But you see in Jesse, you see in his heart this problem where he knows certain things he's doing are wrong. And this, I believe, is a gift of God. I believe this is where God is in this show. Because the truth is, for all of us, and this is applicable to everyday life, we have to make decisions every single day, friends. My moral in life is don't end up on the news. Please don't, because it's usually not for anything good. And friends, all of those decisions that landed those people in jail was because they decided to do something with their freedom. So here's the thing, guys. With all these shows, just like the characters in, in Breaking Bad, ultimately our choices in what we listen to or what we watch can be harmful because they begin to mold the way we think and eventually who we become. Don't believe me? Sounds a little bit too basic. Well, let me show you this. Don't have the video of it, but there was an actual psychology experiment where psychologists created this room double mirror, so they were, they were watching, they were filming what was going on. They bring in like a four-year-old girl, four-year-old girl sitting down in a chair watching a TV. On the TV is a, is a short film of a woman punching and hitting this inflatable doll, punching it, kicking it, pushing it. They turn off the TV. The little girl's like, that was weird. She stands up. She looks around. She sees an inflatable doll. What does she do? And it's kind of cute and funny in the beginning, but then it gets really weird when she picks up like a mallet or a hammer and starts hitting him in the head. And you're like, cuckoo, cuckoo, get that girl some help. What did this show? It shows that we are easily influenced. And yeah, she's a kid, maybe she doesn't know any better, but the truth is, all of us, we've been exposed to so much media in our lives. We've been exposed to so many scenes and so many types of behavior that I wonder how much of it has influenced us. How much of it is actually affecting the way we think now. Because just like in the, char the characters in Breaking Bad or any show, we can slowly embrace and adapt to the values of the things we watch. Seriously. Don't believe me? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to challenge that again. How many times have you seen people on shows who you thought were annoying? Anyone? You know, you're watching a show, you're like, oh my gosh, get them out of my film. Like it's your movie, right? How many times have you, have you seen these very people get picked on or get killed? And you're like, yes! You're like, maybe, maybe I did. What's it to you? Interesting, isn't it? Because we know in a way it's never good to rejoice when someone just got killed. As annoying as they are. Or someone got punked so bad and we're like, yeah! Because if you translate that to actual life, it could become very wrong. Or how many times have you seen a sex scene? A lot of movies have them, and it's honestly, it's ridiculous. It's just for ratings, because half the time it doesn't even relate to what we're watching in the story. Like, why'd you put that there? And why'd you make it like five minutes long, where it just gets really awkward for everyone, you know? And it's like, what am I supposed to do with this? How many times have you seen these things, and people are... are half naked or, or totally naked, and you gave in to the sin of lust. You sinned sitting in the stupid movie theater because of this scene. How many times have we, have we been led into sin? How many times have we been influenced where we were dating someone and, and believe it or not, watching these scenes over and over again started giving us ideas of doing other things with our significant others? How many times have these scenes led us to be tempted to use porn on the internet? How many times have we been led astray because of what we see, what we listen, what we experience through the media? You have to ask yourself these questions because the shows and movies we watch and the music we listen to can begin to represent us. Does it surprise you that literally 100% of young men who are in jail, both adults and minors, for sexual assault, guaranteed they have all used porn in their life, and that porn influenced their behavior. Does it surprise you? Just like that little girl who walked over to the doll and started hitting and punching and kicking it, does it surprise you that the people who are in jail now for sexual assault started getting ideas through using porn? 
Does it surprise you that those responsible for shootings at high school Sometimes, and, and once again, a lot of these guys had mental illness. I'm not trying to make an argument to say that all video games are bad or, or owning a gun is bad. It's, this is not the place or the time for that. But what I am saying is, does it surprise you that those responsible for shootings at high schools got some of their inspiration from certain violent films, certain violent video games? Does it surprise you? You think it's good for you to play Grand Theft Auto day in and day out and not be influenced at least slightly? Friends, we have to ask these tough questions. And I'm not here lecturing you. Hopefully you don't feel that way. I'm not here to say, ah, oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, every time you go home, there's going to be a pop-up screen where I pop up. I'm like, hey, stupid Bill? Yeah. Asian guy. Yep. Remember me? Yeah. Remember my talk? Click X now. I am emailing your mother. I don't want to do that. I don't want to babysit you. But I want you to develop your mind. I want you to develop your heart. I want you to develop your conscience in Christ. We all have that responsibility. And I want you to be able to recognize what is good for me and what is not good for me. How do I know whether or not I should be watching something or listening to a certain song? Little questionnaire that I pulled up for you guys. A couple questions. One, is it good for me to watch this in general? Is it good for me to listen to this in general? Two, is it going to help me as a person? Three, is it going to inspire me to do good? Four, is there any message that I can take away from the show slash film that will benefit me? Now, these are very broad, general questions, but I made it that way so that you could think for yourselves, what are the programs that you are currently watching? What are the sitcoms that you are watching religiously like every day or on Netflix or on YouTube? What kind of videos are you watching? What kind of movies are you into? And I want you to challenge yourself to be honest enough and say, are these things good for me? Is this leading me into sin when I watch it? Is it filling my mind with ideas where it's not going to be good for me? Or is there truly redemption value here? Is there truly a message that I can be blessed with? There's a website in the bottom of the screen, www.usccb.org. Or you can just Google search Catholic movie reviews. Because on this website, there's an actual section under media or movie ratings where Catholic people have the interesting job of literally watching every film and making a critique based on our faith and morals. And that's helpful sometimes, even for me. And truthfully, I've used it at times where I was going to the movie theater and I knew it was rated R, I knew it was a certain director and there might be certain scenes and things. And I was just being honest with myself going, yeah, um, if there's like an all out sex scene, that's probably gonna lead me to temptation, just being honest. So I looked it up and sure enough, they're like warning me about certain scenes that are gonna be going down. They're gonna be showing me what kind of things are addressed in the movie. And there have been times where I had to say, yeah, I can't watch that because I know it's not going to be good for me. I, I know myself and I know that certain things aren't going to help me. They're not going to help me get closer to God. So friends, I want to challenge you to be real. I want to challenge you to be honest. I want to challenge you to literally test everything as 1 Thessalonians says in the Bible. Test everything. Retain what is good. Refrain from every kind of evil. In the Gospel of Mark, there's a story of a rich young man. And this rich young man, he loves God. He loves the Lord. And Jesus is walking down the street, and he literally stops him. And he goes, uh, Master, um, I, I, have been, I have a question. Uh, what must I do to have eternal life? What must I do? And Jesus says, you know the commandments. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not commit false witness. You know the commandments. And he says, I have been following all of these things throughout my life. But Jesus then looks at him with love and says, but you are lacking in one thing. Go and sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. See, Jesus can read our minds and our hearts. He knows each of us by name. And he knows what we struggle with. And perhaps for some of you, perhaps for some of you, that media is that one thing. Maybe the shows or the music you listen to. And I'm not saying you're bad people for listening to certain things or watching certain things, but the truth is maybe Jesus is calling you a step further. Because there's a value to entertainment, but it does not match the value of your relationship with God. Amen? 
Your soul is way more important than being entertained. Entertainment is a good thing, but if it leads you astray, it can become a bad thing. So as we're pondering these things, as you get into small groups later, I want you to think for yourself, is this good for me? Is what I'm listening to good for me? Is what I'm watching good for me? Is it leading me astray, or is it going to be leading me closer to God? And at the, end of the, at the end of the day, you have to make those decisions. So that's my prayer for you, that you develop that muscle, you develop that spirit. Now, as we start wrapping up today, I just want to open it up. If you have any questions, any questions, if you can just stand up, and I'll just call upon you, and if you can just belt it out, because I don't have time to go back and forth and give you the mic. Anyone have any questions relevant to this topic that maybe you need some clarifying with? Bueller. Bueller. There you go. What, um, please belt out your question. Well, I think, and you may have not heard that if you're sitting on the fringes, but basically the question was, what, do you, what is your thought about all the Christian movies coming up in Hollywood? I think there's a market for it. I think that people are genuinely curious to see mu movies that have to do with their faith, and I think that's a good thing. And I hope to God that when these movies come out, they're not corny, because that is the worst insult, because not only is like the media going, oh, it's a Christian movie, but if it's like poorly produced, you're like, gah. Because then it makes us all look like dorks. My challenge to all of you, whatever your talent set, whatever your skill, if you are inspired towards the media or the arts or music or, or filmmaking, please never lose your faith. But please make it excellent. Because Christianity, and Pope John, St. John Paul II wrote a letter to artists, and it's beautiful. And he said that there is a need in our world and our culture for Christians to rise up and reclaim the media, reclaim art and beauty. If you go into museums, if you have the chance to go to the Vatican Museum, you see hundreds of years of art that was dedicated to the glory of God, and it was impeccable, it was excellent, magnificent stuff. And now what do we have? Um, that one movie, The Veggie Tales. <laughs> Veggie Tales is cool, don't get me wrong, but sometimes you have really cheesy corny movies, but there are some good ones. And in fact, I think I saw a trailer yesterday that has to do with Exodus. Christian Bale is going to be playing Moses, which seems pretty sweet. He's going to be like, who are we? We're the Jews. Where are we? We're in Egypt. Alfred, I mean, God. That's going to be pretty sweet. I'm waiting for that one. Any other questions? Thank you for your question. About yes, what do I think about The Bachelor? Woo! I think my wife watches it sometimes. She's like, honey, come watch it with me. I'm like, no, it's weird. I think <laughs> that show is like popcorn that will destroy you. Um, <laughs> here's my problem with The Bachelor, and I think we can all get a general sense of this, is that it's so for the ratings that it's ridiculous. Like, who goes to find their future wife among 20, like, people who are just there to whatever. I mean, it's not a good way to discern your marriage. If you feel called to marriage, please don't go on The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Please. I'm doing you a favor here. Um, I think on that show, there are obviously, you know, for ratings, there are sketchy scenes and very sexual scenes and things that go down that clearly aren't good. But, but truthfully, I think the more important underlying message is if, you know, everyone feels like drawn to romance. Everyone feels drawn to love stories. And so that's why it's such a popular show. Because all the girls are going, I want to be married too. I like Juan Pablo. And it's, <laughs> ill Juan Pablo. Okay, good for you. <laughs> but seriously, how is it affecting your life in the real world? Yeah? 
How is it affecting your ability, ladies and gentlemen, to discern between how do I live a chaste life? How do I actually pursue a woman or pursue a man in this relationship where we can make it godly, where we can accurately discern, instead of being swept up by our emotions alone, which, sorry, doesn't really lead to good decision-making always, all right? Stupidest thing I've ever heard. If it feels right, you should do it. If you're ready, you should do it. That is the stupidest line of crap I've ever heard. For example, amen. If I'm driving down a street in California and we have crazy traffic, guy cuts me off and I start raging. And then they're like, do you feel ready to shoot him? Do you feel ready to run him off the road? and get arrested and never see your wife again? If you feel it, you should do it. Stupid. <laughs> Hashtag stupid. Hashtag remember that one workshop media at Steubenville? Stupid. Any other questions? Last one, go ahead. Okay. All right, so his question was, what if it's a bad song, but a parody is made and it's good? Is that what you're saying? I, I think there's no harm in that, really. I mean, the crazy thing about Christianity is, like, we baptize almost everything. If uh, you have the chance to go to the Vatican someday, right there in the middle of the Vatican, the courtyard, is a giant obelisk. You know what an obelisk is? It's a giant Egyptian structure. It's just like a point. There's an obelisk in Washington, D.C., right? It's one of the memorials. And what does this obelisk represent? It represents hundreds of years of Roman domination. And the Romans did really stupid, like, twisted things. They conquered everyone around. They killed masses of people. And they persecuted Christians, and they threw them to the lions, right? So as much as I like the movie Gladiator, Romans did really crappy stuff. But in the middle of that square in the Vatican, you see a cross mounted on top of that obelisk. And you see on the bottom of the obelisk, inscribed in the stone, Christ reigns, Christ conquers, Christ is victorious. And that is epic. Because literally, this power in human civilization, the Roman Empire, was overtaken by this humble movement that started with 12 anonymous men who were fishermen. And we took that symbol of secular pagan domination, we mounted a cross on top of it, and we baptized it for Christ. And now it's like a really cool thing to see when you're at the Vatican. The reason I bring that up is, and, and granted, it's about a parody, which isn't as cool as an obelisk being mounted by a cross. But the point I'm trying to make is, you know, if it's good, if there's, if there's a value in it, and you don't stray away from your faith, I don't think it's a problem, to be honest. But once again, that has to be discerned with you in your heart. That has to be discerned according to your faith. So even with popular music, for example, that's not on the Christian radio, I don't think every non-Christian song is bad. I, I listen to a lot of awesome artists. Um, I like Coldplay, for example, one of my favorite bands. And I think they write amazing music. And oftentimes they refer to God in a way. But the value of entertainment is good. But the value of your relationship with God supersedes that. So I want you, once again, to walk out of this workshop thinking to yourself, how can I renew my mind in Christ? Amen?